Section 24 From the Easy Chair, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna From the Easy Chair, Volume 3 by George William Curtis the dead bird upon Cyrilla's head, an encouragement of slaughter. The story of the butcher who looked out in the soft summer moonlight and announced that something ought to be done on so fine a night, and he guessed he would go out and slaughter, was told to Melissa, who ejaculated pretty o's and ahs, and said, but how vulgar! Yet had some dreadful Nathan heard the words and beheld Melissa as she spoke, he would have raised his voice and pointed his finger and said, Thou art the woman, for the delicate Melissa was the wearer of dead birds in her hat, and encouraged the slaughter of the loveliest and sweetest and innocent songbirds merely to gratify her vanity the butcher madam may be vulgar but at least he does not kill in order to wear the horns and tails of his victims how hideous exclaims belinda as she sees the pictured head of a savage islander rings in his nose how hideous and the gentle Belinda shakes the rings in her ears in protest against such barbarism. Sylvia, too, laughs gaily at the wife of the Chinese ambassador stumping along upon invisible feet. And Sylvia would laugh more freely except for her invisible waist. It is so preposterous to squeeze your feet, she remarks. It is a deformity, it outrages nature. And the superb and benignant Venus of Milo smiles from her pedestal in the corner, and with her eyes fixed upon Sylvia's waist, echoes Sylvia's words. It is a deformity, it outrages nature. The Puritan preacher, who somewhat perverting his text, cried, Top not come down declared war upon the innocent ribbons that carefully trained and twisted and exalted into a towering ornament doubtless nodded from the head of priscilla to the heart of john alden and melted it completely while the preacher could not even catch his wandering eyes the preacher's course was clear top knots must come down if they allured to a sweeter worship than he inculcated but those ribbons were made for that pretty purpose of adornment they were not victims they silenced no song they hardened no heart they rewarded no wanton cruelty they destroyed no charm of the field or wood they were not memorials of heartless slaughter. They were simply devices by which maidenly charms were heightened, and a little grace and taste and beauty lent to the somber Puritan word. But the top knots of today are bought at a monstrous price. Carlyle says of certain enormous fireflies on an island of the East Indies that placed upon poles, they illuminated the journeys of distinguished people by night. Great honor to the fireflies, he exclaims, but it is a great honor to the golden-winged woodpecker to be shot and then datingly poised upon the hat of Cyrilla, as enveloped in a cloud of dudes, she promenades the avenue on Sunday afternoon. Great honor to the woodpecker, but 
the naughty dog in the country who hunts and kills chickens is made to wear a dead chicken hung around his neck and is at last shamed out of his murderous fancy how if cyrilla strolling in the summer fields happily with the young lawrence hanging enthralled upon her sweet eyes her low replies should chance to meet the curl disgraced with a dead chicken hung around his neck she with the dead woodpecker upon her head the lovely lady puts a premium upon wanton slaughter and unspeakable cruelty she incites murderous small boy and all the idlers and vagrants to share and the shoot of the singing bird and silence the heavenly music of the summer air she cries for slaughter and like the white cat enchanted into the princess who leaps to the floor in hot chase when the mouse appears the queen of beauty with a feathered corpse of a crown begins to seem even to lawrence unhappily enchanted End of section 24section 25 of from the easy chair volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org from the easy chair volume 3 by george william curtis section 25 cheapening his name a distinguished public man once said to the easy chair that after an election in which he had taken part and in which his party had succeeded he always signed the recommendations of anybody who asked him for any office he wished and when the easy chair remarked that he must have sadly cheapened his name with the appointing power the excellent statesman answered not at all because i wrote by mail that no attention was to be paid to my request perhaps he thought that this was not cheapening his name but what must the appointing power have secretly thought of a man who respected his own name so little and an eminent public officer of long service told the easy chair that a recommendation was once delivered to him by an office seeker from a president of the united states and when the officer delaying the applicant asked the president if he really wished the person appointed the president replied not in the least but i gave the letter to him to get rid of him any easy chair must be often reminded of such incidents when it reads in the papers the cards and notices and invitations and petitions to which conspicuous names are attached it discovers for instance that the most eminent ministers merchants lawyers and capitalists are very anxious to hear dr dunderhead upon the history of chaos they compliment the learned doctor's erudition and eloquence and beg him to name the evening when he will speak to them the doctor replies in blushing rhetoric and will yield to their desires on thursday evening the thirty-second on that evening the easy chair which has perused the correspondence with eager expectation and which has a profound interest in chaos repairs to the hall finds a dozen surprised stragglers like itself but not one of the conspicuous clergymen lawyers merchants or capitalists and goes home in bewilderment to read in the morning's paper an elaborate report of dr dunderhead's lecture delivered at the request of the following distinguished gentlemen who are duly named and it slowly dawns upon the easy chair that it has been assisting at an advertisement that the invitation to dr dunderhead was also written by dr dunderhead that the gentlemen signed because they were asked to do so and that the whole proceeding is intended to impress the rural districts and to procure the learned and erudite dunderhead invitations to lecture in other places have these gentlemen no respect for their names they would not endorse the note of a stranger for a thousand dollars because somebody asked them to do it for good nature but it is just as dishonorable to endorse a man's learning and eloquence when you know nothing of it as to endorse a man's promise to pay of whose solvency you are equally ignorant indeed in the one case you could supply the money if the maker of the note failed but dear sirs 
Can you supply the eloquence and erudition which you endorsed in Dr. Dunderhead, for which many easy chairs paid many dollars, and which Dunderhead failed to display? You cannot, indeed, be sued at the City Hall, but you are prosecuted at another even loftier tribunal, and you are mulcted in damages. Your own good name pays the penalty, and is thereafter less respected. If a man does not respect his own name, who will? But if he publicly announces that his name is of no weight, how can he complain if it becomes a jest? There are every day great public meetings at which a long list of familiar names appears as vice-presidents. Very often the gentlemen are notified that their names are to be used, and that if they are unwilling they may inform the managers. But very often also they know nothing of the complicity until they read their names in the report of the meeting. Upon this discovery most men shrug their shoulders, and wish impatiently that people wouldn't do so. But they have a feeling that the occasion is past, that they will be derided as courting notoriety if they write to the paper stating that their names were used without authority. So they grumble and acquiesce. But they nevertheless connive at the abuse of their names. They embolden to further abuse, and they weaken both the power and the effect of disavowal. They condoned the abuse when they were made vice-presidents of the immense and enthusiastic meeting in favor of the annexation of Terra del Fuego. And why, sneers Mrs. Grundy and Mrs. Kander, why should they be too nice to assist at the grand demonstration of fraternity for the Philippine Islands? If the correspondence of Dr. Dunderhead would show that they respect their own names, they would soon find that other people would not trifle with them. But neither must they cheapen them by constant use. There are well-known names that appear upon every occasion. They ask all the Dunderheads to lecture. They petition for and against all public objects. They recommend everything from a Correggio to a corn plaster. They offer benefits to actors. They are honorary directors of institutions of which they are painfully ignorant. Their names appear so universally and indiscriminately that they have no more effect upon public attention or confidence than the machines with which the Chinese bonzes grind out prayers can be supposed to have upon the divine intelligence. The consequence is that all sensible men come to regard these signatures as those of men of straw. And why not? Since they give straw bail for the appearance of that which does not appear, or for the excellence of that of which, if it be excellence, they know nothing. And so, says the old story, after crying wolf so long that the shepherds no longer heeded him, one day the boy cried wolf lustily, for the wild beast had really come. But the louder he cried, the louder they sneered. No, no, we've learned your tricks at last, you wicked boy, and you may shout until you are hoarse. And while they laughed, the wolf devoured the boy. Remember then, dear Dunderhead correspondents, that when Plato himself comes, and some foolish touter obtains your names, or even yourselves, this time know that the truly seraphic doctor has arrived, whose golden wisdom would make the whole world richer. It will be in vain. You have invited discredit for your names, and we who have been deluded, when we see that you earnestly invite us all to hear Plato, shall only smile incredulously. Plato, indeed. Tis only Dunderhead, number 20. End of section 25. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 26 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. From the Easy Chair, Volume 3, by George William Curtis. Clergymen's Salaries Whether we bear or forbear, it is difficult to appease Mrs. Candor. Her responsibility is incessant, and the world always needs her correction. A certain religious society recently decided to give their minister a certain salary, which was apparently larger in the opinion of Mrs. Candor than any minister should receive, and she expressed herself to the effect that no society ought to offer and no clergyman ought to accept so large a sum. Mrs. Candor's impertinence is certainly as striking as her sense of responsibility. 
what business can it possibly be of hers whether a clergyman or a lawyer or a carpenter or a physician or a railroad superintendent or a shoemaker or a bank president is paid more or less for his services it is a purely private arrangement between private persons and if mrs candor had a quick sense of humor which we sincerely hope but are constrained to doubt and were the editor of a paper how she would smile if the easy chair should gravely remark we learn with great pain that the proprietors of the weekly green dragon have decided to pay the editor mrs candor twenty thousand dollars a year this is a sum much too large for the proprietors of any journal to offer and very much more than an editor ought to receive does the laborer cease to be worthy of his hire when he enters the editorial room or the pulpit the facts of the case make this remark of mrs candor's the more comical the receipts of the society in question are very large indeed they enable it to do good works of many kinds and upon the largest scale the bethel for instance one of the wisest charities of good men which gathers in the poor young and old and thoughtfully and tenderly gives them glimpses of a bright and cheerful life the large resources overflowing in benefactions are perhaps chiefly due to the minister whose fame and eloquence constantly draw multitudes to the church the salary which he receives therefore is really but a part of the money which he makes and to put the argument as before if mrs candor editing the paper ran it up and increased the profits for instance by fifty thousand dollars could she feel unwilling to receive ten thousand dollars in addition to her present salary or is she of those who think that clergymen ought not to be well paid then she belongs to the class whose opinion is faithfully followed the clergy are the worst paid body of laborers in the country they work with ability and zeal they are educated sensitive men often carefully nurtured and they are expected to be everybody's servant to hold their time and talents at the call of all the whimsical old women of the parish and of the select men of the town they are to preach twice or thrice on sunday to lecture and expound during the week to make parochial calls in sun or storm to visit the poor to be the confidant and counsellor of a throng and always in every sermon to be fresh and bright and always ready to do any public service that may be asked of course the clergyman must be chairman of the school committee and the director of the town library and president of charitable societies he cannot give a great deal of money for educational and charitable and aesthetic purposes not a very great deal but he can always give time and he can always make a speech and draw the resolutions and direct it generally he is in fact the town pound to which everybody may commit the truant fancies that nobody else will tolerate upon the pastures and lawns of his attention he is the town pump at which everybody may fill himself with advice he is the town bell to summon everybody to every common enterprise he is the town beast of burden to carry everybody's pack with all this he must have a neat and pretty house and a comely and attractive wife who must always be ready and well dressed in the parlor although she cannot afford to hire sufficient help and the good man's children must be well behaved and properly clad and his house be a kind of hotel for the travelling brethren of course he must be a scholar and familiar with current literature and may be justly expected to fit half a dozen boys for college every year these are but illustrations of the functions he is to fulfil and always without murmuring and for all he is to be glad and to get a pittance upon which he can barely bring the ends of the year together and to know that if he should suddenly die of overwork as he probably will his wife and children will be beggars and when a man who does his duties of this kind so well that a great deal of money gladly given is the result and it is proposed that he shall be paid as every chief of every profession is paid mrs candor exclaims in effect that the alabaster box had better be sold and given to the poor if the good lady is of this opinion let her advocate the method of the church of rome if she thinks that a minister is a priest of the old dispensation 
a part of a complete ecclesiastical system, let his support be made part of the system. But if she prefers that a minister shall be a man and a citizen like the rest of us, discharging all the duties of a parent and, and an equal member of society, and leading the worship of those who invite him to that office, then let him have the same chances and fair play with other men. Now one of the proper aims of other men is a provision for their families, the possibility of saving something for the day of inaction, of ill health, of desertion. If the reward of labor which is offered a clergyman is more generous than Mrs. Candor thinks to be becoming for him, if she insists that like certain friars of the Roman Church he shall take the vow of poverty, let her at least be as just to her own communion as to those that the church are to theirs. Let her also insist that he shall not marry, that he shall not be left to the mercy of a congregation that may tire of him, and that he shall be supported when he is not in service, or is unable to serve longer. Does it occur to Mrs. Candor why the cleverest men hesitate long before they become clergymen? Yes, said the great leader of a sect in this country a few years ago, in a convention of his fellow believers. Yes, you wonder why the standard of the profession seems to decline. I will tell you why. If any brother has a son whom he does not know what to do with, he makes a minister of him. And if the good lady with whom the easy chair is expostulating fears that if there are great prizes in the pulpit, the religious character of the teacher will decline, and that the profession will become attractive to merely clever men, she states a good reason for changing the voluntary system, but a very poor one for starving ministers. Nor must she forget to ask herself, on the other hand, whether religion itself gains by identifying its preaching with feeble and timid men. There will indeed always be the great devoted soul who under any circumstances, in riches, in poverty, in health or sickness, in life or death, will give themselves to the work of the evangelist. But Mrs. Candor is not speaking of them. She speaks of an established profession like that of editing, in which she is, let us hope, prosperously engaged. If she is morally bound to give her labor for nothing, or to stint her family, when there is plenty of money made by her honest work, she may speak with the fervor of conviction, indeed, if not of persuasion, upon the impropriety of paying a minister well. If Mrs. Candor ever looks into English history, she will remember the condition of the country curate and the squire's chaplain a century and a half ago. She will recall the contemptuous manner in which he was treated. Macaulay tells of him. Fielding describes him. The plays have him. He is everywhere in the literature of the time, and everywhere a pitiful figure. Whether the portrait of the chaplain be accurate or not, it certainly faithfully shows the feeling with which he was regarded. And if the feeling were justified by the character of the men, what was the reason that the men were what they were? Because the general opinion was then what Mrs. Candor's is now, that a clergyman should not be well paid. The chaplain was a pauper, and he was treated accordingly. The result was certain. Human nature always revenges itself. If you arbitrarily set apart certain men as ex officio, a peculiarly holy class, and deny them the advantages and chances of other men, they will become servile and mean, and lose the noble spirit of a true man. Mrs. Candor may point to the fat English bishoprics, to such a shameful correspondence as that which Majesty records between William Pitt and Dr. Cornwallis, Bishop of Litchfield, and ask if prizes of such a kind are a good thing and if anything could more corrupt good men than such chances. Yes, one thing could, and that is sheer penury and starvation. But there is no need of fat pulpit appointments. Wherever they exist, they will be the objects of intrigue and chicanery. What has that to do with a society giving their minister part of the money that he makes for them? 
if mrs candor insists that the money should not be made and that the preaching should be free the argument is still against her because infinitely more good can be done by the charitable organizations which the money supports than by mere free preaching if she will fall back upon the other system and have the churches built and the pulpit supported by established funds then at least she will be consistent but does she think it desirable for the welfare of society that there should be huge ecclesiastical funds would she restore the dead hand upon the whole it is better that the priesthood or the church as such should hold great properties and dispose of unlimited money the voluntary system has at least this advantage that the money is not ecclesiastically held and while it is the system of her choice mrs candor has no right to complain of those who are willing to pay to hear a great preacher and thereby enable countless others to hear preaching and to be taught and succored for nothing her position indeed is that of those who sometimes invite a speaker to lecture for the benefit of charity who agree to pay the lecturer what he asks and then ask him to take half as much giving the rest to charity they either think that the lecture is not worth the price agreed upon or that it is the lecturer's duty to bestow a sum equal to half his fee the reply to such gentlemen is short it was a fair bargain you have profited by it and what the lecturer does with his part is none of your business and there really is no other reply to mrs candor madam the minister and his friends have made a fine sum of money and what they will do with it is none of your business unless they fall to corrupting the public but indeed there was no need madam to argue for the reduction of the salaries of clergymen we hear in no direction of any tendency to excess but we do hear everywhere of those admonitions donation parties do we make donation parties to other people whom we pay honestly for honest service are bakers and lawyers and tailors and doctors surprised by donation parties they are public confessions of our meanness if we paid the minister adequately why should we abuse the language by donating the necessities of life to the parsonage some kind soul knows that we starve our shepherd that he is pinched and cramped in his household that his wife is thinly clad and his children shabby and that the man of whom we demand that he should be a model of all the cardinal virtues is torn with anxious doubts for his family and that generous soul proposes that we should club our sugar and butter and help him out but if we do not do it next year what is to become of him if we do why not make it a certainty why not dear mrs candor raise his salary and if you madam would only issue a tariff or sliding scale so that we might know how much a religious teacher under different circumstances might properly receive in fine whether all boxes or only the alabaster box must be sold and given to the poor it would be the most valuable service you are ever likely to perform to society end of section twenty six end of from the easy chair volume three by george william curtis